On August 6, 2000, Progress M13 launched from Baikonur. It would be the first unmanned Progress cargo spacecraft to dock with the International Space Station. Progress spacecraft are an unmanned cargo ship based on a Soyuz design and are much the same size and shape as the manned Soyuz crafts. The docking drogue is similar to that on the Soyuz, but features ducting for the UDMH and N204 fuel and oxidizer to transfer to the station. Progress consists of three modules. A pressurized forward module, which carries supplies for the crew, such as scientific equipment, clothes, prepackaged and fresh food, and letters from home. A fuel compartment, which replaces the Soyuz re-entry capsule, carries ample fuel. The propulsion module, which is the same as the Soyuz, contains the orientation engines used for docking. It may also be used to boost the orbit of the station, if needed. Progress was designed to be unmanned and disposable. Though the forward module is pressurized, being unmanned, there's no need for bulky life support systems, heat shields, or parachutes. Unlike Soyuz, Progress doesn't split into separate modules after undocking. Instead, it performs a retrofire and simply burns up in the atmosphere. It brings up cargo, and it becomes a trash can. Progress M13 docked with the aft part of the Svezda module after spending two days in a rendezvous orbit. The next crewed mission was STS-106, launching on Shuttle Atlantis on September 8, 2000, from Cape Canaveral. Four, three, two, one. We have booster ignition and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Atlantis, opening the door to a permanent human presence in space. Houston, roger roll. Houston now controlling the flight of Atlantis. Atlantis completing its roll, placing the shuttle in a heads-down wings level position for the eight and a half minute ride to orbit. Twenty-seven seconds into the flight, Atlantis's three liquid fuel main engines now throttling back in a three-step fashion to 72 percent of rated performance. That will reduce the stress on the shuttle as it breaks through the sound barrier. Very good for Atlantis. Almost one minute into the flight, the main engine's now beginning to rev up. Go at throttle up. The throttle up call acknowledged by Commander Terry Wilcutt aboard Atlantis. Wilcutt joined on the flight deck by pilot Scott Altman, flight engineer Rick Mastracchio, and mission specialist Ed Liu. 
Down on the mid-deck, mission specialists Dan Burbank, Yuri Malenchenko, and Boris Maryukov representing the Russian Aviation and Space Agency. Atlantis already 16 miles in altitude, 13 miles downrange, traveling at a relative inertial speed of 2,200 miles per hour. Three good main engines, three good fuel cells, three good hydraulic power units aboard the orbiter. One minute, 50 seconds into the flight, standing by for solid rocket booster separation. SRB separation confirmed. The goal of STS-106 was to prepare Svezda for the arrival of the first resident crew, or expedition, later in the fall of 2000, and the start of permanent human presence on the outpost. After two days in orbit, Atlantis approached the station and docked to the pressurized mating adapter 2, Birth to Unity. In the back we have the Space Hab pressurized logistics module. And next step from that is the Shosh box or our EVA toolbox. And then up close in the bottom left of the screen is the actual uh, docking mechanism we use to uh, capture the space station. It gets set up to live in space. We can see most people start playing with their food right away and enjoying being in uh, zero gravity. On flight day three, we rendezvoused with the space station. We actually rendezvoused from below. Then we fly halfway around to the top and dock with the station from above. We use a camera that looks right through the docking mechanism in the payload bay of the orbiter. Here's a camera. You can see some of the three wires that intersect, and there's a washer with a target right in the middle of the docking mechanism. And we use that to more or less bullseye the station while we fly around it. Here's a good view of the station. You can see the progress module at the bottom, then the new service module with its solar panels, then the FGB, and finally at the very top of the stack would be the American-built node. the actual docking, it's amazing flying at over 17,000 miles an hour, you can fly the orbiter to within basically a tenth of an inch of another target traveling at the same speed. It's quite a space vehicle. On flight day three, Dr. Ed Liu and Yuri Malenchenko, who were both making their second flights into space, conducted a six hour and 14 minute spacewalk. The spacewalk's objective focused on routing and connecting nine power data and communications cables between Svezda and Zarya, as well as installing a six-foot-long magnetometer, which would serve as a three-dimensional compass to minimize Svezda propellant usage by relaying information to the module's computers regarding its orientation relative to Earth. Lou and Melanchenko used tethers and handrails along the ISS to make their way to a point more than 100 feet above the cargo bay the farthest any tethered spacewalker had ventured outside the shuttle. They completed this with the assistance of their crewmates Burbank and Mastriaccio, who maneuvered them around with the robotic arm. This spacewalk was the sixth in support of the ISS assembly, the 50th in shuttle history, and the second joint U.S.-Russian spacewalk outside a space shuttle following one conducted outside Atlantis while it was docked to the Mir space station in 1997. On flight day four, the crew entered the International Space Station through pressurized mating adapter two and began the transfer operations of more than three tons of hardware and supplies. Atlantis's crew were the first to see the interior of the Russian Svezda service module and transfer of supplies from Atlantis in progress along with maintenance tasks, continued well into the fifth day.
Around the corner from the toilet are the crew compartments, one on each side. They each have their own door, so each crew member has a little bit of privacy, a little space to call their own. You can see there's gear in the back there that was launched in place, uh, bolted down for the launch loads. One of our tasks was to remove that. But even with that gear in place, there's still enough room for me uh, to squeeze in and have a couple moments uh, to maybe take a quick little nap during the middle of a busy work day while everybody else is busy with the door closed. It was a nice, quiet spot. Here you can see that that equipment's now been removed from the wall and placed in bags where uh, the crew members, when they came on board, could just pull those bags out and clip up their sleeping bags and be ready to go. You can also see the porthole in that area. This is the food preparation area where they're going to make their meals. Uh, oxygen generation system, uh, harmful contaminants removing it, removal system, basically an air conditioning system to make sure that uh, the air on board stays safe for all the inhabitants. In the middle, there's a stationary ergometer, basically a workout bike that you can pedal to get your heart rate up to help your muscles stay in shape from atrophying too much during the space flight. One of the things I liked about this was the porthole right in front of us there. You could open that up and while you were biking, basically ride yourself around the world. One of the activities was the installation of three batteries inside Svezda. Not all the installations were easy. In fact, uh, installing one of the batteries in the FGB, we had some problems because a bracket here in the middle of the view um, had some uh, obstructing hardware that we had to remove. And it actually took a hammer and chisel to, uh, to free it up. We're a little bit surprised to find those on board space station, but the folks who set it up thought of everything. We finally got those uh, two batteries and associated equipment installed in the FGB and uh, squared all that away. The reason we had so much equipment to install uh, was that the service module was too heavy to launch in, with most of its uh, electrical system and life support system installed in place. So we actually carried those up inside a progress module and inside the, sh the shuttle, brought them up with them, with us, and installed them. You can see Yuri and myself here um, attaching parts of the electrical system underneath the floor of the service module. Lou and Melanchenko spent much of flight day seven installing voltage and current stabilizers in Svesta. Components of the electron system equipment sent into orbit to separate water into oxygen and hydrogen were installed and would be activated after the first crew arrived. The crew transferred more than 6,000 pounds of material to the interior of the station, including six 100-pound bags of water, all the food for the first resident crew, office supplies, onboard environmental supplies, a vacuum cleaner, and a computer with a monitor. Also brought on board was a ham radio gear for future use by the Expedition 1 crew. After just five days inside the station, the crew vacated the outpost, and Commander Wilcutt and Altman performed a series of four altitude boosts to place the station in a higher orbit. After spending seven days, 21 hours, and 54 minutes linked to the station, Atlantis undocked at 11.46 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time as Wilcutt and Altman fired Atlantis' jets to move to a distance of about 450 feet for the standard double-loop fly-around.
do our deorbit burn somewhere over the Indian Ocean is, is shown on this map here, and that's about 12,000 miles away from our landing site in Florida. We're traveling over 17,000 miles per hour, and our deorbit burn only slows us down by about 200 miles per hour. So when we re-enter the atmosphere, we're traveling pretty fast and we get a really good light show. Uh, we get these bright flashes out the overhead windows as the plasma uh, goes around the vehicle. And out the front window, you can see the glow of the nose as it heats up. It kind of goes through various colors as it heats up. It's a great show. After performing the deorbit burn, Commander Terry Wilcutt guided Atlantis to a landing at 2.56 a.m. Central Time, wrapping up a 4.9 million mile mission. This is the view output of an infrared camera, and of course the wider something is, the actual, the hotter it is. You can see the nose of the orbiter soaks up most of the heat during re-entry. The black rectangles are the landing gear that Scott just put down. They come down at 300 feet, or about 15 seconds prior to touchdown. Here's a view of the actual runway, and during the landing you can see it's going through 250, uh, not, uh, not out 80 feet, and then the touchdown again. Space shuttle, since it's reusable, it uh, comes back to Earth, lands like a big glider. We have three landing spots. Here's the drag chute coming out. Helps slow us down. We touch down over 200 miles an hour. And that's decelerating again from over 17,000 miles an hour. As it goes down the runway there, again, you can see the engine bells are hot. The tires from rolling down the runway picked up a lot of heat. Now it was time for the first resident crew to arrive. 